Section 70 of All About Coffee. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read to you by J.P. Leo. All About Coffee by William Eukers. Early Coffee Making in the United States. The coffee drink reached the colonies, first as a beverage for the well-to-do about 1668 when introduced to the general public through the coffee houses about 1700 it was first sipped from small dishes as in england and no one inquired too closely as to how it was made when half a century later it had displaced beer and tea for breakfast its correct making became a matter of polite inquiry it was not until well into the 19th century that there was any suggestion of scientific interest and not until within the last decade was any real chemical analysis of brewed coffee undertaken with a view to producing a scientific cup of the beverage. At first, owing to the great distances and difficulties surrounding communication between the colonies, news of improvements in coffee makers, coffee making traveled slowly, and the coffee customs brought from Europe by the early settlers became habits that were not easily changed. Some of the worst have clung on ignoring the march of improvement, and seem as firmly entrenched in suburban and rural communities today as they were 200 years ago. Indeed, despite the fact that the United States have been the largest consumer of coffee among the nations for nearly half a century, it is only within the last 10 years that coffee properly prepared could be obtained outside the principal cities. Even today, the average consumer is sadly in need of education in correct coffee brewing. It would be an excellent idea if all the coffee propaganda funds could be concentrated on a study of this one phase of the coffee question for several years, and the recommendations published in such fashion as firmly to fix in the minds of the rising generation a knowledge of correct coffee brewing. The facts of the case are that, generally speaking, coffee is still prepared in Slovian fashion in the average American home. However, with the good work done in recent years by organized trade effort to correct this abuse of our national beverage, signs are plentiful that the time is not far distant when a lasting reformation in coffee making will have been accomplished. In colonial times, the coffee drink was mostly a decoction. Esther Singleton tells us that in New Amsterdam, coffee was boiled in a copper pot lined with tin and drunk as hot as possible with sugar or honey and spices. Sometimes a pint of fresh milk was brought to the boiling point and then as much drawn tincture of coffee was added or the coffee was put in cold water with the milk and both were boiled together and drunk. Rich people mixed cloves, cinnamon or sugar with ambergris in the coffee. Ground cardamom seeds were also used to flavor the decoction. In the early days of New England, the whole beans were frequently boiled for hours with not only pleasant results in forming either food or drink. In New Orleans, the ground coffee was put into a tin or pewter coffee dripper, and the infusion was made by slowly pouring the boiling water over it after the French fashion. The coffee was not considered good unless it actually stained the cup. This method still obtains among the old Creole families. Boiling coarsely pounded coffee for 15 minutes to half an hour was common practice in the colonies before 1800. In the early part of the 19th century, the best practice was to roast the coffee in an iron cylinder that stood before the hearth fire. It was either turned by a handle or wound up like a jack to go by itself. The grinding was done in a lap or wall mill, and among the best known makes were Kendrick's, Wilson's, Wolf's, John Luther's, George M. W. Vandergriff's, and Charles Parker's best quality. To make coffee without boiling, the cookery books of the period advised the housewife to obtain a biggin the best of which is what in France is called a guillette. In 1844, the kitchen directory and American housewife's advice on the subject of coffee making was the following. Coffee should be put in an iron pot and dried near a moderate fire for several hours before roasting, in pot or over hot coals and stirring constantly. It is sufficiently roasted when biting one of the lightest colored kernels. If brittle, the whole is done. 
A coffee roaster is better than an open pot. Use a tablespoonful ground to a pint of boiling water. Boil in a tin pot 20 to 25 minutes. If boiled longer, it would not taste fresh and lively. Let stand four or five minutes to settle. Pour off grounds into a coffee pot or urn. Put fish skin or ice in glass size of a nine pence in pot when pour on to boil or else the white and shell of half an egg to a couple of quarts of coffee. French coffee is made in a German filter. The water is turned on boiling hot and one third more coffee is needed more than when boiled in the common way. In 1856, the Ladies Home Magazine, now the Ladies Home Journal, printed the following which fairly sums up the coffee-making custom of that period. Coffee, if you would have its best flavor, should be roasted at home, but not in an open pan, for this permits a large amount of aroma to escape. The roaster should be a closed sphere or cylinder. The aroma, upon which the good taste of the coffee depends, is only developed in the berry by the roasting process, which also is necessary to diminish its toughness and fit it for grinding. While roasting, coffee loses from 15 to 25 percent of its weight and gains from 30 to 50 percent in bulk. More depends on the proper roasting than upon the quality of the coffee itself. One or two scorched or burned berries will materially injure the flavor of several cupfuls. Even a slight overheating diminishes the good taste. The best mode of roasting, where it is done at home, is to dry the coffee first in an open vessel until its color is slightly changed. This allows the moisture to escape. Then cover it closely and scorch it, keeping up a constant agitation so that no portion of a kernel may be unequally heated. Too low and too slow a heat dries it up without producing the full aromatic flavor while too great heat dissipates the oily matter and leaves only bitter charred kernels. It should be heated so as to acquire a uniform deep cinnamon color and an oily appearance, but never a deep dark brown color. It then should be taken from the fire and kept closely covered until cold and further until used. While unroasted coffee improves by age, the roasted berries will very generally lose their aroma if not covered very closely. The ground stuff kept on sale in barrels or boxes or in papers is not worthy the name of coffee. Coffee should not be ground until just before using. If ground overnight, it should be covered, or what is quite as well, put into the broiler and covered with water. The water not only retains the valuable oil and other aromatic elements, but also prepares it by soaking for immediate boiling in the morning. If the coffee pot, the Old Dominion, of course, for in a common broiler, this process would ruin the coffee by wasting the aroma. Be set on the range or stove or near the fire, so as to be kept hot all night preparatory to boiling in the morning. The beverage will be found in the morning, rich, mellow, and of a most delicious flavor. Coffee used at supper time should be placed on or near the fire immediately after dinner and kept hot or simmering, not boiling, all the afternoon. Try this method if you wish coffee in perfection. Wood's Improved Coffee Roaster is acknowledged to be the best article of the kind now in use. This patent coffee roaster has been improved by the introduction of a triangular flange inside of each of the hemispheres, as seen in the cut. These flanges, as the roaster is turned, catch the coffee and throw it from the inner surface, thus ensuring a perfect uniformity in the burning. The Woods Roaster, 1849, and the Old Dominion Coffee Pot, 1856, have been referred to in Chapter 34. From the Encyclopedia of Practical Cookery, we learn some more about the customs prevailing among the first cooks in the country in roasting and making coffee in the United States about the middle of the 19th century. For example, roasting coffee beans. Put the beans in the roaster, set this before a moderate fire, 
and turn slowly until the coffee takes a good brown color. For this, it should require about 25 minutes. Open the cover to see when it is done. If browned, transfer it to an earthen jar. Cover it tightly and use when needed. Or a more simple plan, and even more effectual, is to take a tin baking dish. Butter well the bottom, put the coffee in it, and set it in a moderate oven until the beans take a strong golden color. 20 minutes sufficing for this. Toss them frequently with a wooden spoon as they are cooking. Another plan is to put it in a small frying pan, one one pound of raw coffee beans and set the pan on the fire, stirring and shaking occasionally until the beans are yellow. Then cover the frying pan and shake the coffee about till it is a dark brown. Move the pan off the fire, keep the cover on, and when the beans are a little cool, break an egg over them and stir them until they are all well coated with the egg. Then store the coffee in tins or jars with tight fitting lids and grind it as wanted for use. Coffee should always be bought in the bean and ground as required. Otherwise, it is liable to extensive adulteration with chicory or suckery. Some persons like the addition, but the epicure who is really fond of coffee would not admit of its introduction. Making breakfast coffee. Allow one tablespoon of coffee to each person. The coffee, when ground, should be measured. Put into the coffee pot and boiling water poured over it in the proportion of three-fourths pint to each tablespoon of coffee, and the pot put on the fire. The instant it boils, take the pot off, uncover it, and let it stand a minute or two. Then cover it again. Put it back on the fire, and let it boil up again. Take it from the fire and let it stand for five minutes to settle. It is then ready to pour. This work recommended as among the latest and best devices for coffee making. All those manufactured or sold in this country by Adams & Son, the English Coffee Biggin, General Hutchinson's Coffee Pot and Urn, combining de Bolois and Rumford's ideas, El Brun's Cafetiere for making coffee by distillation and by steam pressure. Passing it directly into the cup, a Vienna coffee making machine, and a Russian coffee reversible pot called the Potsdam. Among the two score of coffee recipes for making various kinds of extracts, ices, candies, cakes, etc., flavored with coffee, there is a curious one for coffee beer. The invention of Frenchman named Bluhart. The ingredients and quantities in a thousand parts are strong coffee, 300. Rum, 300. Syrup thickened with gum, Senegal, 65. Alcoholic extract of orange peel, 10. And water, 325. It does not appear to have reached any important degree of popularity, adds the editor. In 1861, Gaudi's Ladies Book and Magazine noted with approval the growing custom of hotel and restaurant guests to order coffee instead of wines or spirits with their dinners. On the subject of how to make a cup of coffee, it had this to say. Which is the best way of making coffee? In this, particular notions differ. For example, the Turks do not trouble themselves to take off the bitterness by sugar, nor do they seek to disguise the flavor by milk, as is our custom. But they add each dish a drop of the essence of amber, or put a couple of cloves in it, during the process of preparation. Such flavoring would not we opine, agree with Western tastes. If a cup of the very best coffee, prepared in the highest perfection and boiling hot, be placed on the table in the middle of a room and suffered to cool, it will, in cooling, fill the room with its fragrance. But, becoming cold, it would lose much of its flavor. Being again heated, its taste and flavor will still be further impaired, and heated a third time, it will be found vapid and nauseous. The aroma diffused through the room proved that the coffee has been deprived of its most volatile parts, and hence of its agreeableness and virtue. By pouring boiling water on the coffee and surrounding the containing vessel with boiling water, the finer qualities of the coffee will be preserved. Boiling coffee in a coffee pot is neither economical or judicious.
so much of the aroma being wasted by this method. Count Rumford, by no mean authority, states that one pound of good mocha, when roasted and ground, will make 56 cups of the very best coffee, but it must be ground finely, or the surface of the particles only be acted upon by the hot water, and much of the essence will be left in the grounds. In the East, coffee is said to arouse, exhilarate, and keep awake, allaying hunger and giving the weary renewed strength and vigor, while it imparts a feeling of comfort and repose. The Arabians, when they take their coffee off the fire, wrap the vessel in a wet cloth, which finds the liquor instantly, and make it cream at the top. There is one great essential to be observed, namely that coffee should not be ground before it is required for use, as in a powdered state its finer qualities evaporate. We pass over the usual modes of making coffee, as being familiar to every lady who presides over every household, and content ourselves with the most modern and approved Parisian methods, though we may add that a common recipe for good coffee is 2 ounces of coffee and 1 quart of water. Filter or boil 10 minutes and leave to clear 10 minutes. The French make an extremely strong coffee. For breakfast, they drink one-third of the infusion and two-thirds of hot milk. The café noir used after dinner is the very essence of the berry. Only a small cup is taken, sweetened with white sugar or sugar candy, and sometimes a little feu de vie is poured over the sugar in a spoon held above the surface and set on fire. Or after it, a very small glass of liqueur, called de chasse café, is immediately drunk. But the best method, prevalent in France, for making coffee, and the infusion may be strong or otherwise as taste may direct, is to make a large coffee pot with an upper receptacle made to fit close into it, the bottom of which is perforated with small holes containing in its interior two movable metal strainers, over the second of which the powder is to be placed, and immediately under the third. Upon this upper strainer pour boiling water and continue to do so gently until it bubbles up through the strainer. Then shut the cover of the machine closed down. Place it near the fire, and so soon as the water has drained through the coffee, repeat the operation until the whole intended quantity be passed. No findings are required. Thus, all the fragrance of its perfume will be retained with all the balsamic and stimulating powers of its essence. This is a true Parisian mode, and voila, a cup of excellent coffee. This article is most interesting in that it shows the revolt against boiling coffee had started in the United States. Also, that the importance of fine grinding was being recognized and emphasized by the leaders of the best thought of the nation. Probably the first scientific inquiry into the subject of coffee roasting and brewing in the United States was that detailed by August T. Dawson and Charles M. Wetherill, Ph.D., M.D., in the Journal of the Franklin Institute for July and August, 1855. The following is a digest. There are two classes of beverages, one, alcoholic, and two, nitrogenized. Nitrogenized foods are effective to place the substance of the different organs of the body wasted away by the process of vitality. Coffee is one of these. Besides the tannin, the coffee berry contains two substances, one, the nitrogenized quality, caffeine, which is about 1% and is not altered in roasting, and the other, a volatile oil, which is developed in roasting and which gives the coffee its flavor. Dr. Julius Lehman, Liebig's Analysis 87, 205, says that coffee retards the waste tissues of the body and diminishes the amount of food necessary to preserve life. This effect is due to the oil. Much of the nutritive portion of coffee is lost by European methods of making. Good coffee is very rare. These experiments were made to ascertain whether a potable coffee could not be offered to the public at as low a price as the raw or roasted now is. In order to be successful, we needed to extract a larger portion of the nutritive substance than is extracted in the household. The experiment have proven vain. 
As a result of our experiments with different ways of roasting and brewing coffee, we have found the following plan to be most convenient and the best. The coffee will taste the same every time and will taste good. If a good berry be properly roasted and the infusion be of the proper strength, good coffee must result. A mocha berry should be selected and roasted 7 or 8 pounds at a time in a cylindrical drum. After roasting, it should be placed in a stone jar with a mouth 3 inches in diameter. The jar should be closed airtight. This will furnish 2 cups of coffee daily for 6 months. A quart should be taken from the jar at a time and ground. The ground coffee should be kept in covered glass jars. The best coffee pot was found to be the common biggin having an upper compartment with a perforated bottom upon which to place the coffee. To make one cup of this infusion, place half an ounce of ground coffee in the upper compartment and six fluid ounces of water into the bottom. Put the biggin over a gas lamp. After three minutes, the water will boil. Then steam appears. Take the bacon from the fire, pour the water into a cup, and hence immediately into the top of the bacon where it will extract the berry by replacement. Here follows an experiment. This experiment shows that loss of weight is no criterion that coffee is properly roasted. Neither is the color by itself, nor the temperature, nor the time. Next, we experimented to ascertain whether the aroma developed by roasting coffee and which is lost might not be collected and added to the coffee at pleasure. An attempt was made to derive the volatile oils from roasting coffee by steam and make a dried extract of the residual coffee to which the oils were to be later added. Two attempts were made and both failed. It appears that but a small quantity of the aroma is lost in roasting and that it is mixed with bad smelling vapors from which it is impossible to free it. Then we tried to make a potable coffee by making an aqueous extraction of raw coffee, evaporating to dryness and roasting the residue. Here follows the experiment. This also was unsuccessful. The great trouble here is a dark shiny residue, which, while tasteless, is very disagreeable to look at. In the preparation of coffee by boiling, two and a half times as much matter is extracted as by biggin. The proper method of roasting coffee is as follows. It should be placed in a cylinder and turned constantly over a bright fire. When white smoke begins to appear, the contents should be closely watched. Keep testing the grains. As soon as a grain breaks easily at a slight blow, at which time the color will be a light chestnut brown. The coffee is done. Cool it by lifting some up and dropping it back with a tin cup. If it be left to cool in a heap, there is a greater chance of over-roasting. Keeping the coffee only in airtight vessels. Measure the infusions. A half ounce of coffee to six ounces of water per cup. All extracts of coffee are worthless. Most of them are composed of burned sugar, chicory, carrots, etc. In 1883, an authority of that day, Francis B. Thurber, in his book Coffee from Plantation to Cup, which he dedicated to the railroad restaurant man at Poughkeepsie because he served an ideal cup of coffee, came out strongly for the good old boiling method with eggs, shells included. This was the Thurber recipe. Grind moderately, find a large cup or small bowl of coffee. Break into it one egg with shell. Mix well, adding enough cold water to thoroughly wet the grounds. Upon this, pour one pint of boiling water. Let it boil slowly for 10 to 15 minutes, according to the variety of coffee used and the fineness to which it is ground. Let it stand three minutes to settle. Then pour through a fine wire sieve into a warm coffee pot. This will make enough for four persons. At table, first put the sugar into the cup. Then fill half full of boiling milk, add your coffee, and you have a delicious beverage that will be a revolution to many poor mortals who have an indistinct remembrance of and an intense longing for an ideal cup of coffee. If cream can be procured, so much the better. 
And in that case, boiling water can be added either in the pot or cup to make up for the space occupied by the milk as above, where condensed milk will be found a good substitution for cream. In 1886, however, Jabez Byrne, who knew something about the practical making of the beverage as well as the roasting and grinding operations, said, Have boiling water handy. Take a clean dry pot and put in the ground coffee. Place on fire to warm pot and coffee. Pour on sufficient boiling water, not more than two-thirds full. As soon as the water boils, add a little cold water and remove from fire. To extract the greatest virtue of coffee, grind it fine and pour scalding water over it. John Cotton Dana of the New York Public Library says he remembers how in his old home in Woodstock, Vermont, they had always in the attic a big stone jar of green coffee. This was sacred to the great feast days, Thanksgiving, Christmas, etc., just before those anniversaries, the jar was brought forward and the proper amount of coffee was taken out and roasted in a flat sheet iron pan on the top of the stove, being stirred constantly and watched with great care, as my memory seems to say that this was not constantly done, says Mr. Dana. It would seem that, even then, my father, who kept the general store in the village, brought roasted coffee in Boston or New York. At the close of the century, there were still many advocates of boiling coffee. But although the coffee trade was not quite ready to declare its absolute independence in this direction, there were many leaders who boldly proclaimed their freedom from the old prejudice. Arthur Gray, in his Over the Black Coffee, as late as 1902, quoted, the largest coffee importing house in the United States as advocating the use of eggs and eggshells and boiling the mixture for 10 minutes. End of section 70. Read to you by J.P. Liao, Vancouver, Canada, November 7, 2022.